to high up. That's better. I don't feel like it's so high. <laughs> All right. <gasps> Hi, Jamie. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for all the blue hearts. All right. Oh, I got a lot of blue hearts come in. Hi, Sabrina. Thank you for joining me. I love all the blue hearts. Blue hearts are so happy. <laughs> all right. I don't have coffee. I have tea because it was 95 degrees when I got home. So I was like, nah, we're not going to do coffee. But I'll still drink it out of my blue mug. <laughs> All right. Oh, yes. I am very ready for the three-day weekend myself. It has been a very long week. Long week. And so I just, you know, ready for the long weekend too. <laughs> uh, Sabrina, I'm dealing with, oh, no. Well, I hope you get better soon. Uh, hi, Elaine. Thank you for joining me. Corian? I hope I said that right. I like that. That's pretty. <laughs> Hello. Uh, all right. Tonight we are talking about, um, finding a medical coding job in 2022. Uh, so if you are still a student, this should serve as motivation for you. If you are a job seeker, this should also serve as meta motivation for you. <laughs> um, and if you are somewhere in between and maybe you're working right now and you're thinking about applying at a different place, this will also work for you too. And this is also my monthly live. We are already at the end of May. Can you believe it? So I can't say that May went by really fast because I don't think it did. <laughs> this has been one of the longest months uh, next to April. April was pretty long, but May just, I felt every single day of May. <laughs> um, Hi, Morris. Uh, Jamie, it's been a very busy week and it was long for me as well. Elaine, I was wondering if you don't have your CPC, if it's okay to apply with jobs for jobs without it. Yes, it is. Um, that's another thing I'm going to be talking about tonight, too, is if you have your certification or if you don't have your certification, you can still apply. There's lots of things that you can do and you don't have to wait until you have your certification. That's the great thing about becoming a medical coder is that you can, you know, be in the field and you can be getting your experience you know and you don't even have to have gone through the school yet but it doesn't mean that you don't need to study because yes you do <laughs> um i will be taking my cpc in october and october will be here before you know it uh hi rebecca thank you for all the blue hearts all right so um oh since we have a full house tonight thank you all for joining me it's so great to See all of you at least once a month. <laughs> um, although you did got you guys did get a bonus uh, earlier because on Friday the thirteenth because you know I had missed the month of April again. There was a lot going on in April, so uh, I did a bonus uh, episode this month. I'm going to continue on with uh, doing my lives once a month. This is the way it's got to be for a little while, guys. Um, but you're still going to get shows from me four nights a week, so that's a great deal. Anyway, right. So the next live will be June 24th. So, um, all right. Hi, Beth. Thank you for joining me. Great to see you as well. <laughs> oh, that's awesome uh, that you'll be graduating in, in October. That's great. All right. So let's go ahead and get started. If you are brand new to my channel, welcome. I am Blue. I'm a medical coder. Now, today I am talking about finding a medical coding job in 2022. A lot of people will see in the job listings candidate must have experience. Uh, we're looking for this amount of experience. If you've had this type of training, that type of training. 
So it's like, how can you get in if everybody wants experience? Here's the thing, guys. Even when you have no experience, you have training. And all medical coders who have experience are already going to be working. So a lot of times these employers may put out their wish list. They may put out that they want a particular thing, but it's not necessarily what they're going to get. But if they can't get what they want, they're going to go after the best possible alternative. The best possible alternative for them would be hiring somebody who doesn't have any experience, but is trained and has a good grasp of what is happening. Because sometimes when people go through these medical coding programs, they don't always know what they're doing when they get out in the real world. This is the, the thing that employers will run into. So they don't want to have to spend time training somebody. They want somebody who's going to be ready to be in there and get going. Now, yes, you're going to have questions whether you have experience or not. Just because you have years of experience does not mean that you are well-rounded. A lot of people will stay in their one clinic and that's all of the training that they'll have and, and that kind of thing. So somebody who has five years of experience doesn't really mean anything if you've only been in one clinic. And so that's the thing that employers have to look at as well. But they're going to try to weed out those candidates who don't have that confidence first, right? They're going to say, okay, if we tell people that we only want experience and do not apply if you do not have experience, then we're going to keep those people who, who have not had you know, any experience at all out. That's what they're thinking. But if they see somebody that comes in and says, hey, I got this really good resume that says everything that I have been trained on that is well written because resumes do make a difference. Now, I will say this till I'm blue in the face. <laughs> it's true. Resumes make all the difference in the world, especially when you have no experience and especially if you don't have your certification yet. So what are you trained in? What do you know? You can't just say, oh, I'm looking for a place where I can share my skills and my knowledge. Oh, great. Uh, but what are what is your skills and what is your knowledge? What can you do? Well, I'm in school. Okay, great. Well, what are you learning in school? You know, what, what kind of program are you in? That's the things that need to be on your resume. If they're not on your resume, next. And if your resume has that you are trained in ICD-10, if I'm the hiring manager, next. And you know why? Because there are two ICD-10s. There's ICD-10-CM, which is the diagnosis coding, and there's ICD-10-PCS. So which one are you trained in? If you can't be clear enough to tell me that, next. And it may sound a little harsh and you may think, well, gosh, Blue, that's like really abrupt. I'm telling you what they're not going to tell you. I'm telling you what, okay, if I'm a hiring manager, this is what I would want. I would want somebody who's very clear and going to get to the point. And they're going to give me a nice resume and they're going to give me a nice cover letter. And the cover letter is not going to be a regurgitation of your resume. Okay. This is what you have to have when you're going out there and you're looking at these jobs. So when you're sending in this resume, that's going to be the first thing that these employers see of you is that resume. And they're going to be looking at this like, okay, well, you know, we can give this person a try if, you know, if they're, if what they say on their resume matches up with their skills. So they're going to give you a test. Now, what they test you on is going to be dependent upon where you're applying. If you're applying at a rehabilitation place, like a physical therapy rehabilitation place, they may give you questions more based on physical therapy and more based on injury coding and things like that. Things, things that fall into that kind of category. Now, if it's for like a cancer therapy center, it's going to be on everything, but namely on that neoplasm coding. So you're going to want to make sure you have your skills up on that. Same thing if you're applying at a cardiology clinic or an orthopedic clinic or a podiatry clinic. You're going to need to know those specific that specific uh, specialty. So that's what you need to consider when you're getting ready for these exams, you know, um, for like the assessment tests. <laughs> I've done a couple of videos about preparing for assessments and people get mad at me. I always have some jerk <laughs> who sends me an email afterwards. You didn't say what we needed to study specifically. I'm not telling you guys what specifically to study. What I am telling you is how to be prepared. And when you are applying at certain places, every employer is going to test you differently. I've been through many assessment tests. And while I have done well on them, all of them have been different. Some have been short. Some have been 25 questions. 
Some were 50 questions. Some one packet was 100 questions that had like a, one section of, of same day surgeries and then another section about anatomy, another section about um, the, the coding guidelines. So, you know, it really all depends on where you're applying. You just have to be ready for everything. And for those of you who have stopped studying um, after you've gotten done with your certification and after you've gotten done with your program, maybe you're on your way to take your certification and you've stopped studying wrong. Because when you go to take these um, assessment tests, if you can't pass those assessment tests, you're not getting a call back. Because that says that you need more time to study. And so that's why I'm telling you guys to always be prepared by still continuing to go through those um, through those books. To go through your books, go through the coding guidelines. The coding guidelines are downloadable for free on the CMS website, the ICD-10 CM official coding guidelines. So even if you have last year's books, the 2021 set, and you don't have the 2022 set, it's still not an excuse because you can go to CMS and download those, um, those uh, guidelines for free. There's also the updates in there as well. So you can, um, you know, look at look that over and compare it to your book and make any updates that you need to. Now that I would say that would be okay to mark in your book on that kind of thing. But to be marking in your book, just to be marking in your book, guys, I, I never recommend that. People get mad about that too. <laughs> Trust me, I get people fussing for every little thing nowadays. Um, but guys, if you're writing up in your book, your book is not a workbook. Okay, it is a reference book. It's not meant to be written in so much that you can't even see uh, what the codes are anymore. I've seen some like that. People get real proud when they're writing in their book and circling and highlighting and underlining. You don't need to be doing all that. You need to be looking at the book, reading the, the sections, uh, because it's going to give you the, those guidances about the procedures. It's going to give you the guidance about e &M. It's going to give you all of these things if you take the time to look at it. Because sometimes people will just mark because that's what other people are doing. So they're kind of following the crowd um, instead of actually looking at the book itself. You know, so. Uh, so Brittany says, I ordered the 2023 books so I could take the test before 2024. This waiting game for the books is going to be torture. Uh <laughs> You're planning quite ahead. 2024? You're going to take your test? That's quite a ways away. You're like giving yourself two years to study. Um, and depending on who you're, who you're taking your exam through, you know, uh, with AHIMA, they allow you to use the current yearbooks into the next year all the way up until um, the end of April. Okay. So May 1st is when AHIMA goes over to their next uh, set of certification exams. So every year, May 1st is when they kick over to their new exams. AAPC is January 1. They kick over to their new exams. Uh, but uh, AAPC does allow you to use uh, the older books if you want to. Um, they just, you know, want you to know that if, you, if you're going to use the older books, that's fine. But if you have a code in there that you can't find, you know, it's, it's up to you and use your best judgment. But AHIMA is a little bit more strict when it comes to what books that they allow and you have to have the right year books so that's just something to keep in mind uh shamika says i take my cpc exam next month <laughs> uh well i'm sure if you keep doing your studying you will do just fine make sure that you're looking through all the pages of all of your books um i always recommend that people don't take the time to look through each and every single page of their book and that becomes a problem when you get into the exam room because if you have not gone through your entire book that you don't know where all of the anatomy plates are, where all of the notes are at, if you don't know where all of those things are in that book, that's when you start to panic. Rather than already being so comfortable with this book that you already know where to find things in the book. This is why I tell you guys to don't tab your books. Again, people are going to argue about that. <laughs> that's fine. But here, listen to what I'm telling you when I talk about tabbing the books. The tabs tear the book. 
If you're going through the book like you're supposed to, you're not going to get lost. You're not going to get confused. You're going to go right to where you need to go. And it's not going to be so confusing for you. Because guess what? Even when you are using tabs, you still have to look down the tabs and see which tab you need to go to. And then turn to that one. And then, heaven forbid, if you pull on that tab and you rip that, book, you rip that uh, page. I'm just saying. People tell me all the time, what do I do if I rip my page? <laughs> they tell you you can't have tape in the book. I'm just saying. <laughs> So, <laughs> um, Sabrina says, oh crap, well, I've been learning, I have a learning disability, so the more time I have, the better I guess. Uh, hi, Liz. Hi, Clara. Uh, doing great, and I know where you're from. <laughs> it's good to see you, Clara. So, um, Elaine says, are you going to do an ICD-10 CM guidelines review for 2022? Me on the channel? No. Um, hi, Agnes. Thank you for all the blue hearts. And the reason that I don't do demonstrations anymore is because whenever I tried to do a lesson for you all um, on, on YouTube, y'all don't watch. Y'all have asked me for ENM. Y'all have asked me for diagnosis coding. Y'all have asked me for guidelines. Y'all have asked me for book reviews. Y'all have asked me for all these things. And I have complied. <laughs> you can check my videos because I have complied. And every single time, those are some of the lowest viewed videos that I have. I did an entire uh, modifier series because everybody wanted to know about modifiers. Everybody was asking me about modifiers. Modifiers, modifiers, modifiers. Okay, fine. And I did a whole thing. And not only that, I had to film that episode plus a regular episode. And at that time, I was doing shows five nights a week and so i was doing all of this nothing on the views nothing some of them still don't even have 100 views others don't even have 200 views and they're on a playlist the ones for um uh vlogmas and it's all about the modifiers i even leave the links for like helpful like how to learn more more examples and that kind of thing and i break it down and explain it nothing so ever since then <laughs> I look at what you all respond to. I look at the videos that y'all are actually looking at. And so it's videos like this one today, like I'm talking about right now about finding a job. That's the ones that get the watches. When I do reviews on anything, nothing, nothing. So, I mean, if I did, I would, I would do them, <laughs> but I don't. So, um, uh, hi, Anna. Thank you for joining me. Hi, Kay. Thank you for joining me. Um, you can look through my videos, Elaine. There's a whole playlist where you can see that. There we go. All right. So, um, all right. So getting back to the topic, <laughs> um, so getting ready to be out there in the real world and you don't have a cr uh, credential yet, but you've already finished your program. Keep in mind that even though you say, well, I have a diploma and I completed the program, it doesn't necessarily mean that the employer is going to be like, okay, yeah, we'll hire you. You kind of have to go in with a harder sell um, because then you're going to say, well, um, sometimes they'll say, well, we'll give you six months to get your certification um, because sometimes they'll say, well, if you've completed a program, we're okay with that but you have to get your certification within six months or you have to get it within a year. One lady said that she had up to two years to get her certification, which I thought was very generous. But here's a drawback to that. <laughs> uh, they may not start you at the salary that you think a medical coder should start at if you don't have your certification yet. Now, every place is different, so I won't give a specific number, but I just want you to, guys to keep that in mind. They may do that to you. They may not start you as high on a pay scale if you don't have your certification yet. So while you can get in, and if you were able to get in, hey, that's great. Um, but, you know, because you can still get in, get your experience, maybe six months or maybe even a year, and you then you can move on because you've already got your experience. And at the time, you're still able to get that real world experience You've got your certification, and so now you feel even more prepared. And as you are there, you could still be applying at other places. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's where you have to stay. And a lot of people get kind of caught up in that 
thought that um, wherever I get hired, that's where I've got to stay. <laughs> you don't have to stay there. You can go other places. And while it may be tiring to look for another job, if you're not happy there, then you should seek other employment because somebody else would be happy to have that job. Uh, Liz says, how do you keep uh, from getting discouraged as a new medical coder? Right, right, Elaine. <laughs> um, and you're welcome. Um, so as a new medical coder, job seeking, Liz, or as a new medical coder, like you're in the job and like, how do I figure this stuff out? And I don't know. And I'm getting discouraged because I don't understand. <laughs> so which one are you referring to? Uh, what about the CPCA? Okay. What about the CPCA? Um, finish ask, asking your questions so that way I know what to, what to address. Both actually. Okay. So how do you keep from getting discouraged when you're getting out there and you're applying and they keep telling you no? All right, so it is the mentality that you have. When I went through this as a brand new medical coder and I was out there and I was getting the door slammed on my face every for two months, every day I looked for two months. I also cleaned houses. I was a bartender. I worked at a halfway house all during this time. So I literally worked seven days a week because I worked at the concession stand and I did bartending on the weekends and I did, um, I did uh, other stuff during the weekdays like cleaning houses and stuff like that. So I still looked for work while I was doing all of that. And I would stop and I would do like, like the interviews and things like that. And they would tell me, oh, you did really good. You passed tests. I'm thinking, okay, great. Finally, somebody's going to give me a chance. And they're like, but we have a rule at our facility, which is a BS rule, if you ask me. Um, and this is why I always tell my leaders, if you are in the RHIT, RHIA program, um, that we need to really consider looking at new talent uh, with a little bit more of an open mind. Uh, because again, if you have experience, it doesn't mean you know anything. I've known people who have 20 years of experience who cannot code to save themselves because they don't remember a lot of things and they don't refresh their, their skills. And not only that, you know, they get so cocky that they think they know and they actually don't know. If you're not keeping up every year with new changes, then it's not possible for you to say that you know everything. I will never say that. And I am very experienced. So there is a difference there. you got to have some humility. But my thought process that whole time was I have to find a job. <laughs> I, I, I had my ex-husband right here in my ear. You're never going to do it. You're never going to do it. Oh, oh, really? Okay. Okay. Watch me. Watch me. And so while I had that in my ear, I had moved back home and while it's nice to be with my mom because I love my mom, my mom and I, my mom's passed away, but we were very tight and it, it, it was just, it's just, you want to make your parents proud. I always wanted to make my mom happy and proud of me. So I wanted to make sure that I got a really good job and, and I was doing things, you know, cause I had come out of a divorce and, you know, while my mom made it safe for me to come back home. Um, it was still something that I needed to get my life going again. And so in my head, I was like, I can't fail at this. No matter what, somebody's going to take me on. So I had to have that mentality. I finally went back and my mom, my mom suggested like, go back to the school and ask them, you know, where can you go if everybody keeps telling you no. And so I went and talked to the principal and the principal said, go apply at the temp agency my friend owns. And it's a temp agency for medical professionals. And there's one in every major city. So if you live near a major city or in a major city, you can actually go to Google and, and Google um, um, uh, temporary agencies for medical professionals and it'll pop up. Like all the ones that, that call for nurses, for medical billers, for even for doctors. And so those are the types of agencies that you want to go to because they will get you an assignment. Sometimes it may not be for coding, but it can be for like medical records. Well, now you're meeting the people who are going to be around the people that are doing the hiring. <laughs> and sometimes this is how people get people, right? Uh, employers will get people is they'll go to the temp agency because they want the temp agency to be responsible for weeding them out. Do, do they know enough? And when I applied at the temp agency, they said, okay, here, take this test. And so I said, okay, so they go, wow, you did really good on this proficiency test. And I'm like, thank you. 
Okay, now what? And they go, well, uh, we'll give give us a week and we'll get back to you. And I and I was like, well, you know, I've heard this already, and I'm like, whatever. I'm just gonna keep applying. So I'm still sending out resumes, and within a week, they called me and they said, hey, you know, we have an assignment for you. It's a coding assignment. And I was like, are you really? Are you serious? And I'm like, okay, where is it? And they go, it's at the Cancer Therapy Research Center, but there's a catch. <laughs> of course, there is a catch. What's the catch? Okay. So you're going to be working on backlog and they have all this stuff that they need to get caught up on. So they said that they're willing to hire temporarily three people for three months. So it says a 90 day assignment. They're like, yeah, 90 day assignment. You get three months at the end of the three months. They're only going to keep one of you. And I'm like, well, I mean, it's, it's a start. I mean, it's, it's, it's more, you know, than I'm making right now, you know, <laughs> And so they were like, yeah, so do you want to do it? I'm like, yeah, you know, I'll totally, I'll do it. And so I did this assignment for three months and I learned a lot. Now you want to, you want to talk about being thrown into the <laughs> deep end of the pool right away. Trust me, your first time out of the gate, you're doing neoplasm coding. Oh, you learn a lot. You learn a lot. You learn about different, um, different disease processes as well not just neoplasm coding, but you learn about how the body responds to chemotherapy, uh, to any kind of radiation therapy. You really learn a lot about those procedures. And it's just really something when you get into it. And I also was trained on like how to organize because they still had paper records at the time. There wasn't this huge EMR. I was still coding from the book, <laughs> uh, which I had just finished school. So coding from the book was no big deal for me. Uh, and I hadn't worked with an encoder yet, so I didn't know what an encoder was. And an encoder, if you don't know, is an electronic code book, essentially. So you put in a few words and there's a decision tree and, you know, that kind of thing. So when you when you go through those things, right, um, you're, you're learning as you go. And so at the end of the three months, I didn't get picked. Now, this was not technical ability. This had everything to do with with the supervisor. And this is when I started learning about like medical coders and supervisors and that kind of thing. This supervisor was something else, but uh, it wasn't because I had, I didn't have technical ability. They even said I had technical ability. What it was, was the lady just a personality thing, I guess with me, I thought well, everything was great, but whatever. Uh, but she did pick somebody and I'm like, okay, that's fine, whatever. And so when um, I said, well, I, can, I don't know what to do now. And then they were like, well, give us some time. So I said, okay. So they said, give us a week. So I was like, all right, well, I've heard a week, but you know, uh, they, they, they did me right before. So they'll probably do me right again. So it was a, actually a few days later, <laughs> they were like, Hey, we have a proposition. And I'm like, okay, you know what now? <laughs> and they said, well, we have another assignment for you. This time it's a five-year assignment. So I'm like, Oh wow. You know, this is awesome. You're like, where is it? And they go, it's not here. I said, what? <laughs> I say, what now? And then they, she goes, well, it's not here in town. It's actually eight hours away. I said, well, I guess I'm not going. And uh, she's like, you know, Blue, think about it. Think about it. And, you know, this is a, this is a really good assignment. Um, it's going to pay you a lot more than what you're getting here and which it did. And um, just think about it. She was don't make any decisions today. Just give me a call back tomorrow. So I said, okay. So I hung up the phone and I talked to my mom and I'm like, well, you know, it's, it's eight hours away from here. I'm not going to go. And my mom's like, oh no, you're going. <laughs> and I'm like, but I don't want to leave you. And my mom was sick at the time. And um, like I said, she passed away and I did not want to leave her. I didn't um, because I, I had been there with her. And uh, she was like, no, you got to go because the best thing for you to do is get your experience and you can fly home and see me. It is literally like a 45 minute flight to get here, um, an hour flight at the most. And so you, you'll be making more than enough <laughs> to fly back and forth if you want to. And I said, OK, so she helped me move. You know, she got me an apartment, got me all set up and. So I, that was my first time away from home. I mean, I had moved from my mom's house to my husband's house and then back to my mom's house, right? And then when I got divorced, I was, of course, with my mom. And then this was my first time being on my own and being literally 
in a town where I knew nobody. I had no friends. You want to talk about being scared out of your mind? Hello. <laughs> and I had to keep myself from being discouraged because now I'm far away from home. I've just signed a lease. And now I don't know how I'm going to get along with my coworkers. But this has got to work out. This was a no-fail situation. That was the mentality I had to have. Because when you get into this business, it'll kick you in the teeth if you let it. And so you, it plays with your uh, ego because then you think, do you know anything? And I knew I had to study, continue to study because I wanted to be a strong coder. I wanted to be strong in what I was doing. And I wanted to get that confidence built up. And so when I got there, I was like, okay, I got to just do this. And they were like, okay, well, we want to put you in a clinic, but everybody hates this clinic and um, everybody quits. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. I just moved all the way over here, far away from my hometown, signed a lease, and now I'm going to be in this hard clinic. Okay. And I'm like, well, you know what? I don't know to be scared. That's what I told my supervisor too, Jessica. I was like, I don't know to be scared. So I'm just going to roll with it. She's like, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah, you know, whatever. You just, as long as you show me, I'll, I'll be good. And so she's like, okay. And so I picked it up just like that because I didn't know to be scared. I didn't have a frame of reference. All I had was her telling me that people had quit before. Well, in my head, I had to be like, I can't be like those people who quit. I don't have a choice to quit. I need to be here so that I can make this money so that I can um, move back to my hometown and I can, you know, be with my mom and, you know, do all these things again. And I don't have to be so far away from her and I could just start my life all over again. And so that was just like, okay, I got to do this. And so that's what I did. And for the next eight months, I did that until I found my permanent coding home, which was here. And it's two and a half hours away from my hometown. So I'm like, okay, I can do this. You know, this is a lot closer and getting over here. It was like, okay, I got to struggle with this too. Because this was, I didn't have, I wasn't depending on the temp agency anymore. This was me on my own getting this job. I applied. And then when I applied the first time, they were like, okay, you know, this is a great interview. Everything's good. And I've talked about this so many times on some, some of these episodes this week. But uh, I, I had a really good interview and then I didn't hear anything. And they had said in this interview, they were like, well, you know, if you get the call um, to, to, if you want this job, how soon would you be able to start? I'm like, two weeks to the day I get the call. You know, how much more promising is that, right? And so when I didn't get the call, you know, I'm freaked out and panicked. I'm like, you mean they didn't like me? <laughs> and so my mom was like, no, it wasn't your time yet. It wasn't your time yet. So uh, about a month and a half later, um, the same position opened up, but it was even better for, for, this, for this facility here. And so I was like, well, you know what, I'm going to apply for it again. My mom's like, go for it. And sure enough, when the job closed, it was a, just literally a couple of days later, I got the offer. And I was like, yes, I knew that was a good interview. And so when I met my boss, Laura, a wonderful woman, just very smart, intelligent, like one of the best medical coders I know next to Jessica, my first supervisor who <laughs> I really connected with and trained me, um, but she was just like, you know, you, you did really well in the interview. And I, 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 you know, I was so glad when you applied and I'm like, oh, good, <laughs> this is good. And so, you know, being here and sort of growing up here uh, as far as being a professional and going from, you know, hey, this is a job to hitting 2014 and thinking this is a career. This is not a job. This is not a job for me. And I started this journey in 2009 when I got um, my job there, but I was certified in 2008. And so, you know, that's where it's taken me all that time from 2009 when I got here till 2014 to get that light bulb moment to be think, oh, wow, this is a career. This is not just a job. I really love this. And so it's I have to say it goes back to the mindset that you put yourself in. Because if you already have that defeatist attitude going into it, which I see that a lot for new people because they get discouraged or they go into these darn Facebook medical coding groups, which I cannot stand. These Facebook medical coding groups that promote um, incorrect information. They promote people who are complaining and commiserating 
when you start commiserating with so many people like, oh yeah, you know, oh yeah, that's me. Oh yeah, that's me. And then all of a sudden medical coding is like the enemy for all these new medical coders. And that's not true. If you're actually getting out there and being proactive like I was, okay, I got to go to the temp agency. I got to take a temp job and I got to be able to get in that way. That's how I was able to do it. But now when you tell people, go to the temp agency, I've had people uh, email me after the show. They're like, oh, I don't want a temp job. You know, I want a real job. You think I didn't think that when I was like in the beginning? Like, are you serious? But because you think of it like, oh, it's just like a day job, like day labor. But it's not like that. Typically, when they're hiring somebody temp for medical coding, it's for a block of time because they're not just going to have you fill in for a day just because a, a coder is out. You know what I mean? It's not like that. Um, it's it's more of like, well, you know, you get to spend the time there and you get to learn because they go through these temp agencies to to see if they like you, because if they don't like you, um, because if you don't get along or you you're not you're not producing enough or you want to be on your phone instead of actually working, which some people have actually done and I've seen them do it. Uh, then the employer can say, okay, send somebody else because we don't, we don't want this person. This person doesn't fit in with our job culture. And so then they're like, okay, and they can send somebody else in and you know, it's, it's perfectly fine. Or if the individual doesn't feel like that's a good place for them, you know, that's also something that, you know, it, it it's a two way street. You know, if I didn't feel comfortable when I went to the to the cancer therapy research center, they told me, you know, let us know if you don't feel comfortable there. And we'll try to find you something, you know, whether it's not if it's not in medical coding, it'll be like in medical records or maybe, you know, something else, you know, for you. So, I mean, luckily, it just worked out <laughs> now. I mean, if I would have stayed, you know, in my hometown, you know, I wouldn't have made as much, you know, and like I said, I, I got a very substantial raise when I went to that second job. And so, and then it, this led me here, which led me to another raise. So again, because I wasn't focused on the money, I was focused on getting the work. And once I did that, my priorities were straight and the money just followed. And that's another thing too, is that I find new medical coders want to be so worried about the money right away. Well, I want to make this money because that's what the school says that I could make. But people never look at that it says up to you can make up to now you are doing this with a certification and not a degree because you don't need a degree in medical coding you don't and so that's where it's like okay can we can we get realistic and so when people get realistic and they get that mentality of like nothing's gonna stop me from getting in if i have to start off as a medical biller that's fine if i have to start off as a risk adjustment coder that's fine. If I have to start off and release of information, that's fine. If I have to start off in prior authorizations, that's okay too. These are a good use of your time before becoming a medical coder because all of these jobs get you exposure to the codes. So you don't want to waste your time doing scheduling. You don't want to waste your time doing um, reception, front desk reception, because these two positions do not get you exposure to the medical codes. When you are working in scheduling, again, another thing people argue with me about, well, I started off as a scheduler. Okay, some people do. Some people do, and it works out for them, but the vast majority of them don't. And so they kind of get stuck there because in scheduling, you don't have to have technical skill. You are on the phone. This is telephone work. I've done telephone work before and I hated it. I did uh, tele telework stuff, teleworking, like teleworking on the telephone uh, for one month and I hated it. <laughs> That's the, the worst job I have ever had. <laughs> and I've delivered phone books and I would not say that that was the worst. Uh, working on the telephone, that was the worst. Uh, but, you know, that's the thing. When you have that right mindset, that's going to make all the difference in the world. Um, let's see. Let me check these comments. <laughs> Kay says, it's so hard to find work as a coder with no experience. Sabrina, I'm sorry to ask you this, Blue, as I'm sure you've answered this before, but which test is the one you take for both inpatient and outpatient coding? I bought both ICD-10-CM and ICD-10-PCS. Um, that would be the CCS or the um, CCA. 
Uh, Kay says lots of companies won't accept the CPCA. Uh, Rowena, I would love extra help with modifiers. Kay says, yes, definitely where I'm at in my life. I'm back home and I'm ready to get my life back on again. And when you're at rock bottom, there's nowhere else to go but up. Yep. Liz says, awesome suggestion. Anna says, after you passed your certification and have a job, and obviously you need to keep learning, how many hours a week do you recommend to study? 20. Um, did they give you training or they just threw you in? Uh, they threw us in on the first one. The second one, I did get some training, but because I already knew how to code from my first job, um, it was just more about, it, I was doing the profi coding. So I was working, it's, it's inpatient, but it's outpatient coding. <laughs> so I was learning about that. And that was just a completely different animal there. So, yeah. Um, Liz says, wow, eight hours. Tabitha, hi, Tabitha. Elaine says, that's how I look at it. You got to start from the bottom. Uh, Liz says, I've gotten a few jobs through temp agencies when I was younger. Yeah, the money is important, but I want good experience, and I just want to be a good coder. Um, Elaine says, I worked as a reimbursement specialist. Um, yes, Beth, it was telemarketing. I, I hated it, that job. That was the worst job. Um, Liz says, thank you for your knowledge, Blue. You're welcome. And Sabrina says, thank you. You're welcome. Um, but, yeah, that's, that's what I would recommend. You know, again, you got to get into that... To, you have to have a thick skin to work in this business. Honestly, you do. And people don't think about that. You have to have people that are going to question you and question your knowledge. Again, you can't be a weak person to have this. Because I see a lot of people, like brand new medical coders, they'd be like, well, my auditor said this was wrong. And when they say what the auditor said, actually, the auditor was wrong. But because the coder didn't stand up for themselves, they allowed this auditor to continue on thinking that they were correct. When the individual was actually able to show me a coding clinic that showed that they were actually correct. And I'm like, why didn't you show this to your auditor? Oh, because they said no. And I'm like, again, <laughs> we follow rules. And there's actually a passage in, in coding clinic about that, you know, that you have to follow the official rules that are put out. You can't just say, you know, this is your interpretation and this is what you're going to do because it doesn't work that way. You know, Tabitha says, I'm a CPCA and I've worked remote several months now. The facility I work for found my resume online. I also went to a job fair and that facility um, was also having, and I was hired, well, that's great. Um, Elaine says, uh, so if you, I am saying your name right, am I, <laughs> Elaine? Because I think of Elaine Brennan when I see your name. So I hope I'm saying it right. Or it's not Ellen. I know it's not Ellen. I think it's Elaine. I think I said it right. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Elaine. Um, so if you apply for risk adjustment without, um, so if you apply for risk adjustment coding without experience, yes. I mean, you can apply for any position that's in medical coding without experience, even though they say we want three to five years experience. Again, when you have a really good resume that you're taking to them, they're going to see, okay, this person doesn't have experience, but they are trained on all of these things. They have all of the new training. You're close enough. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> Unless you want to write it phonetically how you say it, you know, sorry. Uh, but because uh, I, I, I hate it when people mess up my name, so <laughs> sorry. Uh, but when you are uh, going through and you're looking at these job listings and it says it's for coding and they say, oh, yeah, you must have experience. You can still apply because, again, the resume is going to tell them everything that you were trained in and what you know. And if you're putting things on there properly on your resume, then you're okay. If you're getting to the point right away and you're avoiding those filler words in your resume, like knowledge of ICD-10, CM, uh, knowledge of CPT, you, you don't need to say knowledge of. When you have it on your skills list, they're going to know that's your skill. ICD-10, CM, CPT-4, Hicks picks level 2. Um, if you learn ICD-10, PCS, ICD-10, PCS, you don't need to say knowledge of. 
Um, you also don't need to put your soft skills on your skills list. By soft skills, I mean um, that you can work independently, that you um, that you know how to answer phones, um, that you are a team player. Those are all of those. No, no, that has nothing to do with the medical coding. Tell me what you learned for medical coding. ICD-10 CM, CPT-4, Higgs-Pigs Level 2, ICD-10 PCS if you did that. Medical terminology, anatomy, pathophysiology. All of these things should be on your uh, skills list. Medical billing, if you learn that. You don't need to go into NCD, LCD edits, uh, CC, CCI edits, and all this. You don't need to do all that. NCCI, you don't, need, you don't need to be listing all of that stuff on your skills list. You need to list your hard skills. Again, the same thing. ICD-10 CM, CPT, HPIX, uh, medical terminology, anatomy, pathophysiology. Those are the things you need on there, okay? Medical billing. Medical billing says all of that, right? Um, and then your your ability to be able to go and work through edits and stuff like that, they are, they're already going to know that because you already know how to do the diagnosis coding and the procedure coding. So you're going to know about those things. If you want to add modifiers in ENM, that's okay too because sometimes they'll say specifically in the job listing that they need somebody who is proficient in um modifiers and the proficient in ENM. And if you are, then go ahead and list those separately on there. But again, keep those other ones off of there, like team player, um, on time, um, you know, those, those types of things. Those are soft skills. You need to keep those off of your skills list. When I'm doing resumes, because I do resume rewrites, my rate is in the description box below. When I do resume rewrites, and I've had very successful <laughs> results because of it, my, client, my clients come back and tell me, and when they see it, it's like, okay, this is clear. Because these, uh, in, these uh, interviewers, they have a few minutes to look at your resume. And they need to see bullet points. They don't need to be reading whole sentences. You need to get to the point right away. And if um, you're listing your job history, only go back 10 or 15 years. That's about as far back as they're going to run you anyway. You don't need to be listing things 20 and 30 years back. Because again... Uh, if you've had multiple jobs and it goes back to um, 20, 30 years, again, only go 10 to 15 years back. Now, if you've only had one employer and you've been there for 20 years, obviously go ahead and put the one employer on there. <laughs> uh, but if you have multiple ones, you know, just don't go past 10 or 15 years. Okay. Keep your resume down to two pages. I've seen so many of them on LinkedIn and it infuriates me because I see them on LinkedIn and it's three or four or five pages and people are encouraging this. Oh yeah, that's great. When, when I look at it, it's all disorganized. It's all over the place. There's not anything clear. There's not a whole lot of detail about what they learned in medical coding. They just say that they went to school and that they got their certification. And then they talk about everything that they did at their other jobs that is not related to medical coding. Well, how can we talk about transferable skills? What did you learn at those other jobs that you can transfer over to be able to show that you can shine for this job, right? When you're finding a job, it's about showing your transferable skills. Now, think about this. If you're a nurse or you're somebody coming in from the medical side, right? You don't necessarily have to be a nurse to, to start off as a medical coder. Trust me. I came back from no background in medical at all. <laughs> Uh, but when you go from being a nurse and you're trying to be a medical coder, don't sit there and tell me, oh, I know how to draw uh, blood. I know how to uh, do all of these things, all this nursing stuff. Don't tell me that. Tell me what you what you documented, that you documented um, the review of systems, that you documented vital signs, that you um, you looked at the list for the ICD-10-CM and CPT and Higgs picks and all these things. And that's what I need to know if I'm the hiring manager and I'm looking at you as a, as a nurse turned medical coder. That's what I want. Because if I see somebody that's telling me all about the nursing stuff that they did, then that tells me this person wants to be a nurse still. They're not interested in the medical coding part. So you need to show how you can transfer over those skills. If you worked in Dollar General, and let's just say um, that you were a manager at Dollar General, right? Or even that you were a cashier at Dollar General. Okay, well, you still have to secure uh, credit card receipts. You still have to keep all of that information secure. So saying that you had to protect private information, boom. 
What do medical coders have to do? We have to be very discreet about what we read. We cannot be uh, saying, oh, did you hear, see about this patient, that patient, this patient? We can't be doing that, folks. So we are very private. We are very secure with the information that we have. So if your job requires you to have some kind of security with information, private information, a uh, personal information, then you need to say that you secured uh uh, customer information or you secured employee information at all times that kind of thing again transfer transferable over if you did a lot of inventory that you worked with specific serial numbers and and you organize things like that again we have to know numbers and letters and we can't get these numbers and letters mixed up so if you have that transferable skill that you were organized in that way again something that you can uh, put on your skills okay and really kind of keep your 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 duties that you did to like four four per job because you get you start getting any longer than that i'm like falling asleep looking at this resume right <laughs> uh so it needs to be snappy and and just keep those extra words out those filler words you know um and i've done so many videos about like tips for resumes uh, again i do resume rewrites my rate is in the description box below um but if you want to check it out uh i will probably try to leave it in the comments after the show um and i'll and i'll probably pin it to one of the first comments um so that way you guys can can look at it there if you're interested um uh, but i recommend writing your own i really recommend that if you're going to send it out uh, for a rewrite that that's going to be your last line of defense. Some people don't feel comfortable writing resumes at all. There's two types of people that write. <laughs> people who write stories and people who can write resumes. <laughs> not everybody can write a resume and I get it. But I also think that it's not right um, when you send it out to somebody who's not a medical coder. Because if they're a professional resume writer, you're going to get a canned response uh, to all the things, and a lot of times it doesn't make sense. I've seen, um, as somebody who rewrites this stuff, I have seen some that have come from professionals, so-called professionals, and I'm looking at this like, you, this was, they did this, and they were like, yeah, and I'm like, this has, this doesn't make sense. As a coder, this does not make sense. Now, I am a medical coder speaking to another medical coder. <laughs> So, you know, I get feedback all the time when I hear <laughs> back from my clients. I had one uh, client that said that um, that the interviewer was like, this is a very nice, pretty resume. <laughs> and, you know, they, they liked it because it was to the point. It was to the point and it was, that's what it is. Time is money. Time is money. And for me, you know, as time goes on, you start to really understand that if you don't know what time, what time is money means, right? Because there's some, I say some things and people are like, what does that mean? <laughs> uh, time is money. So your time and my time is valuable, right? Once that time is gone, you can never get it back. Once this show is over tonight, I will never get these minutes back. The time that I spend with you all and not doing something for my clients, not doing something that I'm supposed to be doing on my own for, for my things, you know, that's time that gets taken away from those things. It, it gets taken away from my sleep. It gets taken away from, you know, getting prepared for shows for next month. So that's what it, well, that's what it means. Time is money. So this time that I give to my clients is devoted to my clients because they, they pay me, right? It's the same thing with Patreon. When I do things for my Patreons, it's because they pay me. And anybody who interferes with that time is taking that time away from my clients. And so because I treat everything, my channel, my YouTube channel, like a precious commodity, I treat Patreon like a precious commodity, I treat my clients like a precious commodity, that's what it means that I don't want anything to interfere. So time is money and you mess with my money. You're messing with my clients. Now you're messing with me. <laughs> and so that's where, no, I, that's why I'm very strict because I will be right there for you, but I need people to be where they are supposed to be. Okay. Which is why you will see that I don't have a refund policy on my, um, on my services either, because I expect that if I'm there for you, that you've got to be there as well. Because there's too many people that try to play with too many people's time 
and you can't be doing that, especially when you know say, well, you know, I have all of these things, and I've I've got kids, and I've got a family. Okay, well, uh, I also work a full forty hour a week job. I have two YouTube, uh, a YouTube and a Patreon channel. I also have a business that I run, which is the tutoring and the resume rewrites and the professional coaching. I do all of that, and I still manage to balance my time. So that's why I say you have to be respectful of people's time. You know, you can't just say, oh, I forgot. And then I'm just supposed to be like, oh, okay, yeah, sure. Doesn't work that way. So that's why your time is very valuable. So all the time that you spend not towards your goal or not doing something to improve you is going to end up hurting you, right? Because if you spend too much time thinking about, well, they're not going to hire me because they say that I need to have experience, that's wasting time. Now you're wasting time. And, you know, people can go for years wasting time rather than just getting into it, dealing with it and facing it head on, having the respect for time and doing that and getting getting your studies in, um, putting your posters up so that you can learn anatomy going through your books so that you can be more familiar and more comfortable with your books and getting more proficient with uh, learning, you know, the books. And I've given my my um, my recommendations for the books to study with, you know, the the um, CPT, CPT, the CPC, <laughs> the CPC study guide, you know, uh, this is the one that I recommend, you know, just to practice for your uh, CPT part of your CPC exam. You know, it does have diagnosis stuff in here as well. But this is a really good book to study with. And if you have, if you need a refresher, this is also a good refresher um, to go through. Because I like the way AAPC breaks it down. That I will give AAPC. <laughs> uh, and I have equal opportunity. If your book is good, I will promote this book. Uh, this is not an ad. I mean, they don't pay me and neither does the AHA either. Now, I also recommend this one for your diagnosis coding. Now, yes, it does say PCS on it as well, but you could skip the PCS parts because they do have just some specific to diagnosis coding. And again, this breaks it down so well. And there's um, exercises in the back and they have the answers. You know, they have this book. But they also have it without the answers. I don't recommend <laughs> the one without the answers. Uh, but I do recommend the one with the answers because how are you supposed to know if you're doing it right or not? And this is one of the best ones to study with. So that's what I recommend, you know, um, that you, you do that so that you can get more confident with what you're doing. Let's see. Um, what do we have? Um, Sabrina, by chance, does joining your Patreon count as CEUs? No, I'm joining anyway. Just thought I'd ask. <laughs> no, because uh, let me tell you, AAPC, to get approved, to have a, a approved a, a, a AAPC, this is approved for one CEU for AAPC, it is so much money. It's like 160 something dollars, I think was what I saw. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Uh, no. <laughs> and I see some vendors give them out for free. And um, somebody said that too. They were like, I, I had done one thing here on YouTube. And they said, well, we wish that we could get CEUs for, for this. And I think maybe that's why mine doesn't get watched because it doesn't have CEUs. Maybe that's what it is. And uh, I'm like, yeah, no, it's too expensive. <laughs> um, I think it was like 160 something dollars for like one to get approved for one hour of a CEU. And there's so many things that you have to do for it. So I have to pay out all this money to get approved. And then it has to be set up in a certain way. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> no. Uh, so, but uh, Liz says ICD-10 PCS is a bear. It's so confusing. Yes, that was my hugest nemesis for the longest time. And at the beginning of last year, when I took the um, CCSP, which is the Master of the Outpatient Setting, I was like, okay, I've done outpatient for years. And I had not done uh, studying for the inpatient part um, since I had taken my CCA. And that was back in 2008. <laughs> and so now keep in mind, we're, you know, in ICD-10 now. And so um, that was the one thing I did worry about when I took the CCS exam last year, which I passed it first try in um, November. 
And so I was, I was worried about it because I was not an active inpatient coder. And so everything that I learned about inpatient, I had to learn on my own. And how did I learn that? <laughs> if you are familiar with my channel, you know how much I love Optum. This is not an ad for Optum, but Optum, I love Optum. I love Optum. So, uh, of course, I always buy their books. Well, their PCS book, right? Um, this one. This is a 2021, so obviously it's outdated. But in the back, every year, right? In the back, in Appendix M, they have a whole list of all of these procedures that you can look up and you can practice with, right? Because in the next appendix, they have all of the answers to the, the quiz, essentially, that's in Appendix M. And that working through that was how I, I learned how to do inpatient coding. So it was a combination of working with this book and getting familiar with this book, which isn't that great, you know, <laughs> and working with this book that helped me to learn PCS. So had I not had those two, trust me, I don't know if I'd, <laughs> I would be as far, far along because I have had my, like, <laughs> When I when ICD-10 uh, came out, right, when it came out in 2015, in 2014 is when we started the training, right? And so I was trying to learn it in 2014. But the way that it was being explained to me, I'm like, you know what, forget this. I don't, I don't have any need to learn this. So why am I going to spend my time, you know, trying to learn something that I don't need? And so I kind of gave up on it after that because I was just like, well, pff, it doesn't make sense to me. Well, then, you know, last year I had, well, actually started in 2020 was when I was like, no, things have got to change. And so uh, that's when I was like, okay, I need to start kind of facing the PCS bear head on. <laughs> and so that's what I did. And so uh, it just takes practice. It's, it's hard because to me in my CPT head, I think removal is removal is removal. <laughs> <laughs> and PCS, oh no, it means something completely different. And when you're removing something and then there's an extirpation and then there's excision, but it's not an excision, but I was like, whatever, you know. <laughs> but yes, that is what I recommend is that you practice, practice, practice. And practice not to make perfection, but practice to understand. Because trust me, there was many a night after I got done with the show that I would go to my room and I would crack open that book for one hour and I would be trying to get those, you know, get those procedures and figure out, okay, what, what is the approach? And no, oh, no, this is the approach and this is control and this is extirpation and this is, you know. So I had to think of these things after getting done with you all and being live. And then there was sometimes I was cursing like a sailor <laughs> because it was, it would just get so frustrating to me. And to me as a veteran, it's very hard um, that, you know, this is the one thing that I had, I had not mastered yet. And so that was where I was just like, no, I got to get this. And, and then as time went on, I was like, okay, now I get it. Because on the ones that I knew, I did not get at all. I was not even going to try to frustrate myself. So what I did was I looked at the answer and I looked in the in the in the appendix, right? Not the appendix, but I looked in the uh, tabular section and I was looking at it to try to like associate, okay, this is what this means when they're talking about this. When they say total, this is what this means. Or when they say removal, this is what this means. So doing those kind of word associations really did help. <laughs> But again, it was just a lot of practice and that desire to like, no, I'm going to get this no matter what. And so that was where you, again, having to be in the right headspace and in building that strong character. It's not always easy to be strong. It's not always easy to be like resilient, right? This is something that is learned over time. Everybody goes through things in life. And it makes them, it'll either make or break them. Whatever you allow in your mind to, to, to go on, to take over, you know, that's what the end result will be, right? If I had of looked at all the things that were happening between 2005 and 2008, well, and I, I can say actually till 2009, 
when I lost my mom. If I had looked at that time and if I had allowed that time to break me, you know, going through divorce and going through all of those things. And, you know, it, it was, you know, you're you're married for all of these years. You want to do the right thing and, and you want to have things work out. And when things don't work out, you know, that's when it's very difficult. Now your life changes. And then now the person that you have that you're so close to, because I was very close with my mom. And then that she's the one person that I've always only trusted in my whole life, right? And, and you know, I of course, I loved my ex-husband, you know, and my ex-husband subsequently died as well. And so if I had allowed all of this to break me, you know, the two people that I love the most, to lose both of them and not not focus on something else and not focus on, okay, I've got to keep my head above water. If I had allowed that, to, it would have taken everything from me. I would not have what I have now if I had just allowed myself to just kind of fall into that. And it was very hard. And, I, and I've and i said it before. I did an interview with Brian Kui, who is the medical coding geek. And it was weird because I had that epiphany at that moment. Like, um, yeah, uh, he's like, well, we were talking about why I got into it. And I said, you know, it actually saved me. Because when I had lost my mom, I'm just trying to keep my head above water. Uh, and I had started in a new place and I didn't know anybody. And I had literally moved <laughs> three times in one year. And I was just trying to stay, stay in it. And the one thing I could focus on, the one thing I could rely on was the coding. And that was what I did. And, and so that was how that grew. And so it's how you develop your coping mechanisms and how you think and look at things. And for me that I thought that this, I cannot fail at this. That got me through how I thought about, this is what I want. I had a visionary of like, these are the things that I want. I want to live in a nice place, have a nice car, you know, be able to wear nice clothes and, you know, be able to go on trips. And I was able to do that. And then in 2014 is when I was like, okay, it really started to click. Like, I was like, okay, now I get it. This is not just a job anymore. This is, this is a career. And this, this career has led me to so many things. I have a YouTube channel with 18,000 subscribers, <laughs> 18,000 subscribers that I didn't pay a cent for, right? Cause you could pay to have your stuff boosted, but I don't have to do any of that. And I, I have touched people with just my experiences. And I don't do it just because I, I want to do that. I want to share what I learned. Because I think when we don't have somebody to say, hey, yeah, I went through this. And yeah, it was hard. And yes, this time did suck, you know. Uh, because there was a couple years, it was just like, what am I doing? <laughs> and... You know, when you go through all these things and you're able to to have those those goals in mind, there's nothing that you can't do. And now there's a, there's so many things that I have going on right now that are great and that are good. And I am just so glad. And I know it's making my mom proud, which is is so good for me because that's what I always want to do still, even now. <laughs> and and being able to do that is 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 making everything so much more fuller for me. And I don't have to wait until I'm retired to be happy because there's some people that say, well, I'll be happy when I retire. And I don't have that. I, I'm happy now. And, you know, they say, if you love what you do, you work a day in your life. And I said that since the beginning of my channel. <laughs> and it's true. I don't feel like I'm working. This is not work. Even though if you, if I was to tell you everything I do in a day, you'd be like, oh, no, Blue, that's work. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, uh, Elaine says, no worries. I know who you are referring to. I have applied for several jobs, but because I don't see two plus years. Okay, thank you for answering that. Um and I said, oh, Liz says, do you list your certifications that your name is followed by uh, CCA sufficient? So when you have the CCA and you get like the CCS or the CCSP, the CCA dissolves. So now I currently carry 
just the two. I carry the CCS and I list that first because that's the mastery of inpatient and outpatient. And then I um, list the CCSP because that is still the mastery of the outpatient setting. Um, you can carry both of them. You don't have to uh, because sometimes people will just get the CCS and then let the CCSP drop. I'm going to carry them both because I earned them both. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, but once you get that, um, any of those, when I had the CCA and then I got the CCSP first, the CCA dropped. You can't carry both of those. You can't carry both of those on your name. That's not right. It's not appropriate. Uh, you can see that on the AHIMA website. So once you get the CCSP, if you get that one, um, the CCA will drop. You know, if I had gotten the CCS, the CCA would drop. So, you know, I'm only able to carry what is valid on my name, which is the CCS and the CCSP. Uh, hi, Yvette. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for the blue hearts. Um, Kay says, is there a way you can save the, this video afterwards, please? Oh, I don't. Um, some people will not let their video, like, stay on. They they delete their lives. I'm like, you went through all that. <laughs> I just leave it up. So, uh, I leave it up. But, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it up. Um, hi, NC. Liz says, well said. Elaine says, true. Yvette agreed. Uh, Elaine, I did not know that you coached. Yes. Uh, Liz says, yeah, but usually they only give you a CU if you're watching it live. Um, Elaine says, I have heard that you can also get free CEUs from AAPC. Um, uh, Elaine says, to me, PCS is easier than CM. People say that. <laughs> Uh, Liz says, what is the name of the pink book, please? I could not read the title. It's ICD-10-CM and ICD-10-PCS coding handbook with the answers. Um, and I do have the link, the uh, Amazon affiliate link in the description box below. You don't have to click on the link though. Um, Kay says, uh, Andrade, hey. Thank you so much for sharing with us. I find senior coders don't like educating new coders. And sometimes they'll do that because nobody trained them. You know, that's what they say. But I don't think that's right, but you know. Uh, Liz says, I love the fact that you are a HEMA certified. Most folks on YouTube are APC. <laughs> it's easier to relate to someone under the same umbrella as you. And here's the thing with that. So people will ask me, Blue, you're not with AAPC? Like, what's the deal? I, I'm not with AAPC because I don't need to be, right? That was my knee. Y'all heard pop just now. I can't believe my knee was so loud. It's so embarrassing if this happens to you. If, I know I'm just getting off topic here, but it's so embarrassing. Sometimes when I walk and my knees go crack, 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 crack. I'm like, can you stop? You know? <laughs> anyway, uh, so um, people will ask me, how come you don't get with AAPC? Well, I don't need to because... Um, my credentials already say I've, I've mastered inpatient and outpatient coding and my CCSP says I mastered outpatient coding. Why do I need to double the credentials? Okay. And you only need one certification in the beginning. Obviously I'm a veteran coder. I should, uh, in theory, it's okay to have more because I have experience now. Right. Uh, but there are some people that are just like, well, you know, you should you should get certified with both associations. I don't need to. I can still talk to AAPC folks if they'll listen to me, and which they do. Majority of my audience is AAPC, and they're still willing to listen to me. When I hear them come back to me and tell me, well, Blue, I passed my certification because I, I, I looked at your tips and, and I followed your study guide and things like that, and it helped me, and I'm like, you know, that's awesome, you know, and it's nice to hear that from AAPC folks. You know, I, I welcome AAPC folks. It's, I don't, um, I don't, I don't discriminate because <laughs> uh, to me, they're both the major medical coding associations. Yes, it is easier when you have somebody with the AHIMA because then you, you kind of know like, yeah, we know that, you know, we know, you know, this or we know that or whatever. And so, uh, because there are things that are specific to, um, Ahima that are not specific to AAPC, so I totally get it. <laughs> uh, but yeah, a thug life is laughing. <laughs> I like the name. <laughs> but yes, you can 
you can turn your life around. That's the, the moral of the story today, too, is you can turn your life around. You can change things. You don't have to be a product of your environment. You don't have to be a product of where you came from. You don't have to be a product of your educational level, okay? Because people, get this, get this, hear this. People who have a high school diploma or a GED can do this. High school diploma or GED. Now, I had somebody comment uh, that says, can you do this without a high school diploma? I said, no, you need a high school diploma or a GED to be able to get into the program. And then, of course, you're going to need it when you go to apply for a job. And I said, why don't you just get the GED? <laughs> and, you know, somebody told me that was so rude. Why is it so rude? Why do you think that telling somebody to get a GED is rude? There's nothing wrong with getting a GED. A GED is OK, folks. It, it's OK. <laughs> Um, really intelligent people have a GED, all right? So I will just say that. And, you know, having a high school diploma or a GED is fine. You don't have to have a college education to get into this field. You don't have to have a college education to be a medical coder. Now, it takes a lot of self-study because we have to know what doctors know while never having gone to medical school. Yes, it's true. Because when we read these documentations, right, we look through the medical records, it's a lot. And these words are quite foreign sometimes, so, you know. <laughs> um, uh, Momzilla says, how do you go about re resume or job search if doing a self-study or independent study in medical coding? Uh, because you have your certification. And your certification says that you can, I mean, it doesn't matter if you have, uh, if you did independent study in order to sit for your exam. Because uh, if you look on the AHIMA website or even on the AAPC website, um, you don't have to have formal training, okay, in order to sit for these certification exams. The CCA or um, the uh, CPC, right? You don't have to have, you don't have to go through a formal program, okay? You can self-study. It's the same thing with the CCS or the CCSP, you can self-study as well. And so when you self-study and you go and you take your certification exam, well, then all of the things that you were tested on, on those certification exams, ICD-10-CM, CPT, Higgs fix um, you know, medical terminology, anatomy, pathophysiology, all these things you have to know, HIPAA, uh, ENM, modifiers, all these things you have to know. These are all of your skills. They go on your list. Just because you don't go through a formal program or you don't go through like, you know, a school or something doesn't mean that you're not qualified to be able to have education as far as like, um, like your skills on your resume. Does that answer your question? I hope so. <laughs> Loka says, where would you recommend to apply for jobs? Hospitals. Um, you can apply for hospitals. You can apply at urgent care clinics. Um, I, I prefer hospitals, okay? Because you can go in a lot of different ways in the hospital, okay? Like if you have a major hospital in your area, some, some have, um, you know, medical centers in their area, right? Where like a, a lot of hospitals are, you know, around, clustered around. And you can go on their on their on their website and look for jobs where it says uh, uh, employment or work with us or careers. They usually say careers, right? You look at look you can look at all the available careers that they have available in that hospital. And I would recommend working in those. I really kind of don't recommend working in small doctor's offices. Now, <laughs> here's why. Okay. A lot of times, doctor's offices that are independent, they, they try to cut corners on cost, right? And so they think that they can get away with, well, my spouse can do the billing. And here's the problem with that. A lot of times these spouses do not take coding courses. They do not take billing courses, which is so frightening, but they don't do it. And I always encourage spouses of doctors that they're the ones doing the office managing and stuff like that, and they don't have a biller and they're doing it. You need to learn about coding. 
but uh, I don't recommend working in those situations because it's usually the spouse that runs the office and they usually don't treat the coders the best way either. And sometimes they'll, they'll hire them on as a biller because they'll say, okay, fine, this is, a, this is a coder. She could be a biller too or he could be a biller too. And, you know, we're going to push all of these things on them. This is just the experiences that I've heard from, from people that write into me, okay? Uh, it may not be at every single place. Some some doctor's offices may may get it. I mean, they may understand. And then we'd be like, oh, no, that's not the way we are here, in which that would be ideal, right? Uh, but just keep in mind, it's usually the spouse that's running the office. And, you know, if you're the one coming in there saying, oh, no, this is wrong, that's wrong, you know, they may get offended, you know, uh, because they don't like to not know something you know and sometimes sometimes it may be the opposite sometimes they may be like oh thank goodness you're here um and now we get it but i would just recommend to apply at hospitals because again hospitals you're going to have a lot more security as far as like you know insurance goes you know you have a lot more benefits and there's a lot more um places that you can transfer within right even if you started off in a release of information release of information requires you to know about hipaa well, when you are in a formal program or even when you are taking your exam, you are being tested on privacy, right? HIPAA is one of the things that's covered on all exams <laughs> for medical coding. So that is something that you need to think about. Think about all the things that you've been trained on, right? And so if you're working in a hospital, again, um, you hear about an opening position in medical coding. Oh, hey, I'm a medical coder. Let me transfer over there. They're a lot more willing to hire from within than they are, you know, having to start from scratch again. Because once you get into the system, oh, you're 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 ready to go because they've, they've done your background check. They've done, you know, your screenings because they usually have a screening um, and, you know, whatever else that they have at that uh, facility. Sometimes they'll have you be vaccinated. OK, that's something else to keep in mind. I know people get sensitive about it. I'm not here to debate you. I'm just telling you what these hospitals are saying. Some I see, they say it's okay not to, but it's typically, those are companies that are not involved in hospitals, but they do like contract work, okay? So that is something else to kind of keep in mind. Contract work is kind of hit and miss, all right? Uh, so that's... Uh -huh. I, I would stay away from that. I would more go for the temp agencies first and I would go for the hospitals first. So, okay, good. <laughs> Mom still says thank you. All right. <laughs> so guys, it is possible to get a job in 2022, even if they are saying that we want experience. Apply anyway. Don't let that stop you from applying, okay? Even if it says don't apply if you don't have experience, show them that you have a good resume, show them that you, you know, that you're willing to learn and that, you know, um, so that way that they can get you in there. OK, don't don't be discouraged by not knowing you're not going to know everything. None of us do. I, I've been a veteran medical coder since 2008, and I will still tell you I don't know everything because I'm humble enough to know that. <laughs> uh, and, and that's OK. It's OK not to know everything. But, you know, don't let that stop you and don't let your circumstances of, oh, well, you know, I didn't get this best formal training and things like that. You could still learn on your own. You could still learn on your own. And there's plenty of tip videos on my channel. Please go through the videos, guys. I've got so many uh, really good videos. I try to put the names of them like, you know, like as close as possible to what the topic is about. Um, I haven't done a whole lot of lives. Like I said, I've been doing lives once per month now. And my shorter shows are like taking over. And by short, I mean they're 20 minutes. It's very difficult for me to do short videos. People tell me all the time, they, I get complaints. You need to shorten your videos. I, I don't, I, I, this is why I'm not on TikTok. <laughs> because <laughs> it's, how can you get information in little, little quick snippet bites? I can't, you know, uh, I'm a Texan. I naturally talk, you know, and so it's just, I don't know. <laughs> but I don't know. I guess I got to adapt. I don't know. But to me, it's just, it's, this is not something that you can learn in 60 seconds or less or in a two minute video or a three minute video that doesn't work. You need time to explain things. Cause if I try to explain things quick, then people get confused because it, when I did try to shorten it, 
people were even more confused. So I said, no, I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna leave my 15, 20 minute videos the way they are. <laughs> uh, Locust says, how long did it take you to find your first job as a medical coder? Two months. Um, Liz says, I will definitely be checking out the modifiers. Yay! They're finally gonna get some, <laughs> some view time. Uh, they're under the um, the playlist for uh, Vlogmas, okay? Uh, so there's two times of the year that YouTubers do a, like a lot of shows because, you know, it's Christmas in July and it's uh, Vlogmas at the end of the year. So they do like, you know, 12 days of Christmas or 25 days of Christmas and they'll do the same thing in July because it's Christmas in July. I'm not doing anything for Christmas in July and I'm also not doing Vlogmas this year. I'm not doing it. Uh, it's just because of just a low amount of views on those videos and people ask for them. I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do them this year. Uh, because <laughs> you know, they're there. I mean, you know, I may like re promote the old videos, but I won't do any new ones this year, but hopefully they help you. There's a lot of really good links in there, um, that I talk about. So hopefully that'll help you to kind of like get some other examples on those modifiers. Uh, Logan says, I love your videos. Thanks for them. Very helpful. Oh, yay. <laughs> um, I'm so glad. I'm so glad because, like I said, try to be helpful and, you know. <laughs> um, oh, thank you, Momzilla. She says, I'm truly grateful for you, Blue. And thank you for the blue heart. Um, do you have case study videos? Again, I tried to do those and those didn't work out so well. And I think I have, let me look and see. Um because I did do example ones. Let's see, let me go to my thing. I may have taken them down uh, because I used to do this thing called uh, Quiz Friday and then people started to be ungrateful. So I took it down. So <laughs> I've been through a lot with my channel. <laughs> I try to change it. Uh, let's see how to get some. No, I think I took them down. Yeah, I took them down. Yeah, I did. Uh, so that kind of content, that kind of stuff, uh, I do that on my Patreon channel. I do like um, on Patreon. Patreon is a lot like YouTube, but you pay to support the creator, which is me. Um, and it's $10 a month minimum pledge, but you get access to all of the quizzes and all of the puzzles that I post. I make um, like crossword puzzles and I make find a search a word puzzles. I do the search a word like uh, I'll say like this is cardiovascular terminology and you got to find all of the cardiovascular words that you can. And so then I'll post the answers later. I'll do things like that. I'll do like slide deck presentations, you know, on injury coding and e and &M. I did the E&M series. Um, the E&M series kind of slowed down a little bit because again, having to kind of regroup. <laughs> uh, but uh, I do those kind of things on Patreon because, you know, those people are paying to be there and they want to learn and they, they want to be engaged. So that's why I leave all of that stuff there. Um, you don't have to subscribe past a month if you don't want to. Uh, but uh, that pledge will get you access to all of that. You'll get personal videos about myself, stuff I don't share on YouTube. And um, there's also Patreon Jeopardy that I do on there. Uh, so it's like Jeopardy, but we talk about like all the different categories. Like I had, uh, so you want to be a medical coder was one of the categories. And then I had medical terminology and e &M, So I would ask different questions. And then I give a, a gift card. You know, I did a Walmart uh, gas card last month. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it's just different things. Try to change it up, you know, do just like little things and then I had a guest speaker my first guest speaker which was a really awesome experience so I have this viewer um, and I can't even call him a viewer anymore I, I call him a friend I, I really do Brandon so Brandon uh, graduated high school got his certification in medical coding right uh, he got his his CPC he took, it took him six months, but he found his first job in medical coding. Then, you know, he, he became this rock star medical coder, right? So then he got his COC and he also got his CCS. So he just got his CCS last year. And uh, so I invited him to do a guest presentation because he also subscribes to my uh, Patreon channel. And so he just did this whole presentation, which was so great because 
It gives him good practice on doing presentations. And it also shares what he's learned as a pediatric coder, which is really awesome. <laughs> and he's done facility coding and he's done a clinic coding. So he knows the difference and he was explaining that. And it's just really awesome to see that, you know. And so I tried to do those types of, of you know, a, guess things uh, at least once a month or if I'm if I'll do the presentation myself and it'd be live over zoom so there's plenty of time for questions and things like that and I'll post those slide decks on patreon um, so that it's exclusive content for patreon so I mean I, I like it I try to do different things so that people get their money's worth out of the content um, and then I'll do like um, just simple ones where you're looking up the diagnosis codes and I'll do the answer key later on. Sometimes I'll put just the answers and then sometimes I'll put like, um, like the rationale to it. It really all depends on the situation. So, you know, <laughs> but that's what I do there. Uh, thanks Liz. Uh, oh, you're welcome Elaine. <laughs> um, yeah. Sabrina says, do we need to have the coding books to be able to do your quizzes and puzzles on Patreon? Some of them, yes. Uh, some of them, no. I mean, it's medical terminology as well. So medical terminology and anatomy, you don't need coding books for that, you know. Um, and you, I mean, if you have your coding books, it doesn't necessarily have to be this year's edition that you have. You can still be working with like a 2021 edition and it'll be fine, you know. If your code looks a little different from mine and, and perhaps you don't have my answer in your book, then you know that that's probably an updated code, you know. So that, that's always possible. Um, share the site. Um, it's patreon.com forward slash medical coding with Lou. And just, just another note, Patreon charges one time a month, right? So if you signed up, like on the 20th, they will charge you again on the 1st because everybody gets charged on the 1st. So if you want to join today, just keep in mind that it may or may not charge you again on the 1st. So that's just something to be aware of. If you want to sign up after the 1st, I totally understand. If you only want to sign up for one month, just to kind of check it out and see and, you know, get a feel and you don't want to subscribe for a month past that, that is totally fine. That money goes towards my education. That's all that money goes for. And so that's what I do with that. It keeps me on my toes. It keeps me um, sharp and makes me a better coder. Um, and that's that's what it's there for. So that's what I do with that money. Um, do you do coding clinics? Uh, I don't do coding clinic. I mean, the only one who does coding clinic is coding clinic. <laughs> uh, but as far as like, talking about it i guess i could talk about like a coding clinic that i see but i don't i don't do that um yvette if we join your patreon are previous puzzles and and uh quizzes available yes um when you join let's see what it says let me see what it says public page wah, wah, wah. Okay, by becoming a Patreon, you instantly unlock access to 726 exclusive posts. I never knew I did that many posts. <laughs> so 221 images, which when I post about um, like the, the crossword puzzles or the final word or any of those, I post it with a with a PNG image and then I attach the the the, the JPEG image. So that way you guys can print it off. So 221 images, 98 links. There was one poll that I did because I was asking about the time. Uh, 430 writings, which is like all the answers and stuff like that. And 34 videos. So those are my personal videos. The ones that stuff that I don't really talk about on the channel. Uh, and, you know, that's what I share, you know, on those, um, those things. So uh, some of the levels, like... Right now, the minimum pledge is $10, and that gives you access to all of that. Um, if you go for the annual package, you save like 10% per month, and then um, you get 
a bonus gift if you sign up for a whole year. Um, you get a tutoring time with me or you get a resume rewrite. And so, you know, my resume re rewrites are $125. So think of the savings there. I'm just saying. Uh, at the $25 level, if you pledge that, you get one hour uh, per month with me. Uh, and that could be tutoring. It could be professional coaching. It could be whatever you want. But you get me on Zoom for one hour uh, per month. Uh, and you don't have to use that one hour in the same month. And even if you only wanted to pledge one month and you wanted to cancel and then you say, hey, three, three months down the line, you say, hey, Blue, um, I never used my my one hour with you. Can I use it? Yeah, sure. That's fine. Uh, because you've already paid for it. So <laughs> um, so that's that's something there, you know, you can you can have. Um, and that's with that. So uh, and then there's also, you know, um, just the other levels as well, 50 and 100 dollars. So you get more time as the time goes up and then. Um, at the hundred dollar level, then it's like you get um, you get time with me and you get your resume rewrite as well. So, you know, that's just what it's there for. <laughs> all right. So, <laughs> who said? Oh my God, it's blue. Who is that? Of course, a long time no see, sir. <laughs> you happen to catch me today? So, everybody, it's John. <laughs> He used to be in the chat all the time when I did like my nightly shows. He would come in. Him and uh, and uh, Justin would be talking. <laughs> Good to see you, John. Um, Kay says, oh, definitely subscribing. You upgraded your mug, I see. I did. I did. This is a gift. But I think it has everything to do with the eyebrows. You see the eyebrows? <laughs> Because sometimes people say this is my eyebrows or my face. I, 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 I can't hide like I can't hide my my thoughts sometimes in my face. It just shows my face is too loud sometimes. I don't know. <laughs> mm. But anyway. So <laughs> it made me want chocolate. <laughs> uh oh chocolate. So speaking of chocolate, oh. I got some um, of those Hawaiian chocolate macadamia nuts. Oh, so good. That was the one bad thing about Hawaii is those is those chocolates. They have the best chocolates that come out of Hawaii. Now, of course, I'm sure there's other Swiss makers of chocolate that are even better, but oh, those chocolates from Hawaii. Oh, so good. Dangerous. <laughs> But as far as hot chocolate, hot chocolate, I would want, of course, in the winter time. It was 95 degrees here today in Texas, so it was very hot. And I don't know how we go from 80 degrees the day before to like 95 degrees. I don't know how that happens. Whatever. <laughs> so, but anyway, um, well, I guess I'm going to go ahead and wrap this one up because it's almost getting on two hours and I'm not going to get after myself for being so long on, on lives because I watched this other YouTuber, uh, named Rick. He has this channel called think like a horse and he does really long lives cause he'll be talking and he is the most hysterical ever. Like when you get him going <laughs> and I think the people get him going sometimes on purpose because he'll start saying all these things and he's funny. He, he used to be in the military. He's retired military. He used to be a cop. So, I mean, like, he thinks a lot of common sense type stuff, you know, and just some of the things that he says, I'll be cracking up and I'll be listening to him because his lives go on for like four or five hours sometimes. So I'm like, <laughs> I'll listen to it. I'll be at work and just listening to him go on and I'll just be sitting there cracking up. People be like, what are you doing? <laughs> just listening. Um, my best friend lives there. They are very good. Yes. And I really appreciate your insight and willingness to share. Oh, you're welcome. All right, so my viewers are dropping like flies. We're down to 17. So <laughs> um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this one up, guys. Thank you so much for being here. This was a great live. I hope you all have a very safe holiday weekend. Just take care of each other, guys. Take care of each other. Study. If you haven't been studying, keep looking for your job and you know work on your resume. Look through my videos. I've got a ton of tip videos out there. There's like 800 and something plus videos. And so there's a lot of advice that I give and it's just, it's there, it's waiting. <laughs> uh, you're welcome, Liz. Thanks. And I will see y'all next time. Bye.